And welcome back to another edition of the On the Board Sports Podcast. I am your host, Will Trucci, a.k.a. Will C. Uh, coming to you from Long Island, New York. Obviously, you can see here, I got the equipment going on in the background here with the gym equipment. And joining me, west of me, he's in Queens. I'm talking with the one and only Sean Thomas, a.k.a. Shawnee on the mic. Sean, how are you? Well, I'm doing good. Happy Sunday to you and to everyone. Uh, I'm doing good, man. Pal, how are you doing, man? I'm doing all right, but Sean, I got one thing to say. Hey, hey, what do you say? We have a very special guest with us. Joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina, is the one, the only, the legendary voice of the Carolina Hurricanes and of NBC Sports Network. Yes, we are talking with the one and only John Porcelain. John, thank you for coming on. How are you? I'm good, Will. Sean, how are you? Uh, good. Thanks for having me. I got lots of time. <laughs> Looks like you're training for something. That's good. <laughs> I see in the background. That's good. But uh, we're doing okay down here. We're doing all right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, for the people out there that are watching this on, on YouTube a little bit later on, that's the gym in the background. For the people that are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, just picture the gym in your head at this point in time. But <laughs> Hey, it absolutely, but yeah. we're making the best of a bad situation yeah. right now. John, how are you making out during this whole quarantine right now? Well, I'm okay now. And I think at the beginning, uh, middle of March, March 12th to be exact, it was a little touch and go because I had been exposed to the, um, the same hotel room that Rudy Gobert, the Utah Jazz occupied before I checked in with our team. So I had to go through a, a two-week uh, strict quarantine away from everybody, which is much different than sheltering in place and being with your family. So the first two weeks of this were unnerving. Thank goodness, uh, no symptoms. I never got tested for it because I didn't have any symptoms. But uh, since, that, since then, it's just been maintaining our family and doing what everyone's doing right now, waiting it out and hoping for the best and, and, and praying every day that we see less and less uh, fatal statistics and, and, and hopefully we're going to get back to normal. Absolutely. There's going to be a new normal that's going to be happening right now. But with everything, John, I'm glad you're okay right now. And I'm glad the families are right too. So that's two thumbs Thanks. up here uh, from, from myself and from my partner. Uh, John, real, real quick here. How did you get into broadcasting? And how did you get with the Whalers and, and your time with the Whalers, even up to now? Yeah, there really wasn't a set plan for any of this, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, 50 years ago, uh, May 10th, 1970, Bobby Orr scored the goal. I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. We know the play now, and it's been burped up a lot lately because of the 50th anniversary, but he scores the overtime winner in game four, gets tripped, goes through the air. Iconic play in all of sports, iconic image. But it was that day that I listened to Dan Kelly call the game on CBS, and I, I really uh, got the bug, I think, that day. I, 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 there was something about it. I, I couldn't put a, a, handle, a handle on it then. I was only eight years old. But I started my hobby. So I wasn't a hockey player. Um, I, I played the conventional sports. I wasn't exposed to hockey. Um, I tried it when I was around 12. I got frustrated because little kids were way better than I was. So I, I stuck with baseball mostly, which was my game growing up. But in the meantime, to kill time and to pass time through the winter, I would broadcast games off the television. My dad was my color man. And we taped them all, and we did all the Bruins games. I developed, I guess, a style. I played it for my friends. They encouraged me when I was going through high school. They're like, man, you ought to do this someday. But I, I really didn't know how to go about it. So I'm an old guy, right? So I graduated high school in 1979, and the time was different. There wasn't as much uh, cable sports. There wasn't any. ESPN uh, came to fruition in 1979. So you're basically dealing with four or five channels on television. That's it. Mostly national broadcast. I went to my guidance counselor. I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be a play-by-play -play guy in the National Hockey League. And she looked at me and said, you better have a backup plan. I have no idea how to steer you in that direction. I guess you could go to school for broadcast journalism or something like that. But how about you keep that in the back of your mind and do something safer, right? We always get that safe approach. So I went to school uh, at Springfield College, and I was going to become a teacher, maybe a baseball coach in either high school or college. 
And there was one course taught as an elective in broadcast journalism. I took the course. I VO the 1981 Super Bowl between the Bengals and the 49ers. I did well with it. The guy that taught the course told me he was a news director at an NBC station in Springfield. And he told me, if you ever get a chance, go for it. You have something there. So the, to close the story as quickly as possible, I went to graduate school at Adelphi University in Garden City, New York. Mm -hmm. I had to do an internship in the American Hockey League. The owner of the team asked me one day at lunch, do you have any broadcast experience? And I said, lots. But he never asked me for who? Do I have a tape? Did I, do I have a reference? He just said, I'll give you a chance to do some color for our guy who's brand new. He's struggling a little bit. Let's see where it goes for you. Well, by chance, he would leave after one year. They hired me. I worked there for seven years in the American Hockey League and honed my craft. I got a chance with the Whalers, and that's it. And then the national work that's come my way started around 1997, and that's basically been my career. Very lucky. Uh, took it very seriously. I worked very hard at this. I have as a pro, and I did as an amateur. I really worked hard as my hobby. I immersed myself in this. I immersed myself in um, influencers and people that could help me or I aspired to be. I, I read a lot. I, 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 I just, that was my thing. That's kind of a passion. And I was lucky to live my passion. So I consider myself pretty lucky. That's awesome right there. Hey, luck is where opportunity meets action, John. And you definitely, definitely hit a home run out of the park with that so far. You know, it, it's just absolutely crazy, especially since you get to see Hartford basically in the final couple of years, right? Then they move over to Carolina. You get to see Carolina through its playoff in 2002, 2006, when they won the Stanley Cup, and even in 2009, even last year. So that's awesome to see. It really was. And, and this journey we've been on here since 1997 – is, is rewarding because we started from nothing. Uh, we came down here to a virgin area. They weren't really in tune with hockey unless they moved here from New York or Canada or Massachusetts or, or some place where it's been regionalized up until then. And so we started from the ground floor, built it. The team has had some really good success, made the final in 02, won the cup in 06, made the conference final in 09. And then after 10 years to see it rekindle the last couple of seasons, last year particularly, and then this year until the pause, uh, there's, there's vibrancy back here again. They love hockey here. It's a great place for the National Hockey League, and, and the team now is uh, interesting to watch. It's a lot of fun to watch. The, the bunch of jerks, as they're known, the Carolina Hurricanes, have, have kind of established a cult following. You know, it's not, a, not an established team, an original six team by any stretch, but it has tradition. You know, it's over 20 years now, so that's a long time. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're proud of it, and it, it's worked out really well. That's excellent, John. That's excellent. John, um, can, uh, can you tell uh, me and Will, what goes behind the scenes of preparing for an NHL game? Because it's so fast-paced. You have to change up words and say things so quickly and so fast. Like, just like, what is a morning of afternoon of the game day for you John a great question Sean I mean I think for me it's a it's a, first of all it's a 12-month program okay the way pro sports are today you really can't drop it at any point if you do what I do it's hard to play catch up so the off season you're still doing a little bit of work not as much obviously I take they take my summer seriously and have fun and enjoy my family and have when they were all growing up and all that kind of thing but then as you get closer to the end of August and September, you know, I, a month out of training camp, I take one team per day and immerse myself in that team, get my rosters aligned, get the summer information down pat, move guys around from team to team and just kind of refocus where you're at, get a book knowledge of all 31 teams, really. And then you get to your training camp and then a season. But the normal day for me starts the night before where I do about an hour and a half's worth of work late afternoon the night before a game, just a framework of my board, so to speak, of, of each team, roster boards that I'm going to complete the next day. Just lay all that out, uh, get that organized for the next day. Every, every night, no exaggeration, I'm watching the league every night during the season. So I, I, I can't watch the NFL. I love football. I can't really pay attention to my baseball team, which is, are the Boston Red Sox. I give them up in September, usually never see the postseason. 
because there's too much hockey to watch. And then the day of the game, it starts early in the morning. There's about three and a, three hours of work before I leave the house for the morning skates, go to the morning skates, cover those off, come home, clean up the rest of the work, uh, get ready to go back to the rink again. And basically I'm finished with my prep by three o'clock. I don't like to prep before the game. Now some people do. And then again, this is different for every broadcaster. You figure out your way of prepping, you know, on the way up, what works best for you. For me, I want to just relax when I get to the venue. Maybe there's a couple of things that I might adjust. You always learn something when you get there, you hear some news, somebody might not be playing at the last minute, something along those lines. But I want to be relaxed, get ready for our production meetings, attack the broadcast, rehearsal, you go live, you do the game. And then you have to really over-prepare because you got to right. understand that, and you'll hear this from various people, at least 95% of what you prep, you never use. It's basically 5%, but you have to be ready for every scenario. Right. You have to be ready for every guy. In our case, there are 40 guys available, plus coaching staffs and management teams. So you, And maybe the officials, too. you got to have those, those stories just in case you get an emergency backup goalie come out of the stands and play <laughs> and actually win the game, right? right. That's the most unbelievable thing that's ever happened to me in broadcasting. But, and, and so that situation this year with David Ayers in Toronto was, uh, was mind-blowing. But that's what I'm driving at. You have to be ready for all scenarios. Right. What, was, what was that moment like with, with having to call that game up in Toronto for you? Because, David, because the whole goalie situation up there with Carolina, it's just absolutely crazy. Peter Mrazek, one day, you know, he's playing there. Then another goalie comes in. I know McElhaney was the backup goaltender last yeah. year at that point in time. But, you know, Things, things are crazy, and here comes a 42-year-old guy that was just driving Zamboni for a minor league team, and he's, he's playing in, in Toronto, in his, home, in his hometown, just about crazy stuff. What was that like for you? Well, first of all, the, the context of the game, the Canes were not playing very well at the time and needed the game badly. The Canes hadn't played on Hockey Night in Canada in years. I want to say almost 10 years, Saturday night, national television in Canada, which is a big thing for the players, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them, you know, grew up watching Hockey Night in Canada on a Saturday night. So that's, that's a big thing. Um, and then you get to the game. Yeah, not one, but two goalies get hurt. The Canes are actually ahead, playing the best they've played in a couple of weeks, and now this. So he comes in the game, automatically you think, well, they're going to lose. This can't go well. Toronto with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner and John Tavares, William Nylander. You know, where's this going to go, right? Mm -hmm. But he gets in there, does his thing. First two shots go in. Now you're thinking this, this game's going to be over. They go to the second intermission. But the, the key here, Will, is that we had to tell a story now with no information. The league doesn't provide any of this information. We were lucky to get his name. So we had a Google as we were going along who this guy was, substantiate the stories because you can't believe, as they say, uh, I don't want to use this because I hate the term, but anyway, fake news, right? <laughs> but you don't want to say something that's out there in the internet that might not be true. There's a lot of that. So making sure it's all correct and factual. And now we have to tell his story. And as the game got into the third period and the Canes were playing in front of him as they were and he was starting to make saves, you're thinking, this is history now. And so we had to tell the, our audience who he was, how old, he had a kidney problem, uh, he drove the Zamboni. This is like a Hollywood script, and it played out unbelievably. One of the greatest stories we've ever seen. And it was kind of, it was kind of unnerving because I wasn't 100% sure what we were saying was totally accurate either. And what if you got something wrong? You could even just mispronounce his name and screw up that moment in history. But that was flying without a net, but it came out very well. And, and his performance was extraordinary. That's amazing, John. That is amazing. I re yes. remember I came home and I'm looking at the <laughs> sports. I'm like, they got a guy from where? The Zamboni. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> so that was so crazy. John, um, my question for you is, obviously, you have your own style, the way that you call the game, the way that you say words. Growing up and when you were young, were there any broad uh, casters that you either tried to look up to or pattern your own um, uh, style on? 
you know, uh, my biggest influence was a guy named Fred Cusick who did the Bruins games for over 40 years. I grew up listening and watching him and Bob Wilson on the radio. So that's obviously an influence, but a lot of the guys nationally, you know, of that era in the seventies, Kirk Gowdy, Marv Albert, uh, a lot of these people that, you know, came out of the New York area, did national games, Vin Scully, you know, those were tremendous influences. Keith Jackson on a Saturday afternoon with college mm -hmm. football. Okay. And maybe the one guy, maybe the one guy is a play-by-play -play caller that I admired the most and tried to pattern myself maybe a little bit, because I don't like patterning uh, myself or anybody. Sean, my advice to anybody aspiring to do this is get your own style and use other people as influences, but don't emulate because that person's already done that. But that guy for me was Pat Summerall. He, he was fantastic. I, I thought, you know, you might remember him, you guys might not, uh, you know, because again, I date myself, but he was, he and John Madden were tremendous on the NFL. And yep. the thing about Pat, he was an excellent athlete. He played for the Giants, the football Giants. Um, and then he was able to do golf. He's able to do tennis. He did football in an extraordinary way, but he used very few words. He, he was great at letting the moment on television carry, let it breathe a little. You know, I think that's really important. And he was able to do that in a great way with a signature style. I, I really enjoyed it. And he wasn't, he wasn't the show. The, the game is the show. You can jazz it up a little bit, but the game still is a show. And he was, allow, he was allowing himself to do that. That's awesome right there. That is absolutely awesome, John. I got to ask you this. Out of all the years that you've been doing color, uh, not color commentary, but actual play-by-play -play commentary, who has been your favorite play, uh, color commentary guy? We know that Trip Tracy is your guy for the past 10-plus yeah. years. What's, yeah. it, what's it like working with a guy like that? And who's yeah. been like the, the best that you've been, been around? Well, Tripp and I are attached at the hip now, right? So we're like Siamese twins. It's been so long. So we've been together a long time, probably as long as anybody in the league right now in terms of tenure. So it goes right. back to 1998. It goes back that far. So, you know, that familiarity is, is unbelievable. And we're able to, you know, know in advance of what's going to happen next just through instincts based on his style, my style. It's kind of... Uh, blended together over the years and it works well. But on the national front, so many great people that I've worked with in hockey, uh, the, it just goes, the, in terms of analysts, each one is different. Each one's coming from a different place. And as a play caller and a teammate, which is what I love about broadcasting, you're an extension of sports, you're, you're a team. Uh, it's my job to draw it out of that guy. So Eddie Olchek has a lot of different personality traits, and experiences that are different than Pierre Maguire or Brian Boucher or Keith Jones or guys I work with at NBC or with ESPN. I worked a lot with Darren Pang, uh, you know, um, and others, you know, al along the way, Bill Clement, you know, there's, there's a lot of names here. They're all different in unique ways, which make them excellent at what they do because they draw, um, they, they draw from their experience to kind of bring you along as a viewer or a listener to a place that's going to make your experience even better. My only regret is I never got a chance to work with John Davidson. I wish that I had a chance to work with JD. He had already moved on to management, you know, with the blues and the blue jackets and now the Rangers. But back in the day, if I ever had a chance to work with him as, as a partner on, on one broadcast, because I think he was, he was excellent as a color guy. The Rangers MSG were very lucky to have him for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very well, well said, John. John, this may be an unfair question to ask you because I know you've been live there for so many great games. Is there like a top two or three, like the greatest game that you've ever seen, won, or called? To? Yeah, you know, this always, this question always gets to a, a kind of a trite answer where people say, okay, are you serious? I'm, I'm going to tell you, Sean, that you could have a game seven circumstance, game, game seven, and, and be like, you know, that should be the be all end all. And you can have what happened with David Ayers in the regular <laughs> season happen, and then that, that could be the be all end all. Or you could be very proud of a, just a mundane regular season game which is still your job. Right. So 
sometimes, and I had a lot of practice for 10 years, this team here didn't make the playoffs. How do you make it palatable? How do you make the broadcast entertaining, even for a fan base that's down, dejected? You're trying to get them to buy into a rebuild. You're trying to buy into a new general manager, a new coach. How do you accomplish that? Sometimes that's as rewarding as triple overtime in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, uh, as I think about it, I did the 100th anniversary outdoor game in Toronto between Detroit and Toronto. Um, uh, the only outdoor game I've announced. That was a special day, special circumstance. The game went to overtime. Austin Matthews won it in overtime. That was in 2017. That was a remarkable um, experience for me. Um, got to work the 2011 All-Star Game here in Raleigh. Um, was on the ice hosting the skills competition in the arena, over the PA, with all the guys. That wasn't exactly play calling, but that was a unique experience. The next right. day I did the All-Star Game on radio for the nation. That was great. But they're, they're all different. And, and I'm lucky again, and I mean this, uh, they've all been great to me. They, they, they've all been equally on the, almost the same platform. John, that is absolutely awesome. I got to ask you this, though, because Sean and I were Islanders fans. Last year, yeah. you, you, you broadcasted <laughs> the second round of the Hurricanes versus the Islanders, and many people, many Islander fans, including myself, up until I kind of said to myself, hey, John Forslund's just doing his job here. What was that like for you having to call – the Hurricanes on a national, nationally televised uh, TV series like that? Well, first of all, you have to understand that for, for six of my seven years in the American Hockey League, the Springfield Indians were the minor league affiliate for the New York Islanders. Right. So Bill Torrey had a big role in my career. Darcy Regeer did. Al Arbor did. And all of those players – and Barry Landers gave me my first opportunity to do radio with him on the Islander Radio Network back in the 80s. Jiggs McDonald was a mentor of mine. Legend. So I'm saying all this because I have a very good appreciation and respect for the Islander fan base. I also know how passionate they are, which passion drives, you know, excess fandom, which can send you over the top which I knew was probably coming my way. But the best compliment you can have in our business is that your superior, in this case, Sam Flood at NBC Sports, made the decision to put me on that series. Now, he did so, as they did with Doc uh, many years ago when he was the Devils announcer. He did a lot of national games because the Devils were good, and he mm -hmm. was doing those important games, but in a balanced way. And I'm sure there were people saying, he's the Devils announcer, but Doc is so great. He was able to do it the right way. So I was convincing myself I could do this. I was flattered that they put me on the series. There was a, it, it was funny. I was likely going to the Central Division, but then they decided to keep me here, which I was appreciative of, and to do the games. Now, we had that one moment in game two, which was like a lightning rod. We had at Barclays Center, worst place in the world to call a hockey game. Uh, you know, the low broadcast position, we had a situation where the puck hits the far post. I call it off the post. Fans think it's in the net. No one knows whether it's in or not. The officials didn't know. They had to go to review. Eddie thought it was in, Eddie Olchek. This is on Big NBC, Sunday afternoon, prime time. A lot of eyes on this game. Yep. Brian Boucher is inside the glass. He has the reverse angle. He clarifies it. He's absolutely, Johnny, you're right. It was off the goal post. And as we would say, if you, and Sean and I were having a conversation and we agreed on something, I might say, we're good. Well, I said, we're good. Well, the Islander fans, many of them, went viral <laughs> and went nuts because they thought I was saying, we're the Hurricanes. We're good. And there's the bias. Well, anyway, <laughs> there was a story the next day. Um, they, they, and Newsday had called NBC. I had to get on the phone. Uh, no one at NBC felt they needed to justify anything or apologize. They felt it was a appropriate comment but I had to get my point out there so I bring that story up because it was a dicey moment for me as the series went along I never lashed back at any of the fans I got a lot of hate tweets and people were saying some really bad things that's part of the business when the series was over I thanked the Islander fans for their passion you guys are great 
and I got this flood of great stuff from all the Islander fans after the series was over. I tried to do my job. I think I did it well. Um, no difference in calls. You know, uh, that's how I do a normal game anyway. I, I've, I've, been, I've been almost terminated a couple of times for being too objective to my own bosses with the Hurricanes ownership. And, but I, I won't, I won't um, compromise my, my beliefs. I think you have to call a game that way. So it was unique. It was a different circumstance to do your own team against the Islanders, but it, it was a very passionate series. There's no question. Absolutely was. All those games are crazy. I was there for games one and two. You know, the play, you know, the place was absolutely rocking. I know people loved Nassau Coliseum and, you know, at the yeah. time going over to Barclays is eh. It is what it is, but you got to make the best of a bad situation. But yeah, it's a, in, but the atmosphere is tremendous. Absolutely. I mean, it's just I wish we were up higher to call the game because we're yeah. low in that building. It's a it's really a horizontal view, mm -hmm. so blocks, goalposts, tips are hard. Mm -hmm. They're hard anyway, but they're really hard when you're almost flatlined as a sight line, you know. So, yes. um, but it was it, it was it was one of those closer than four. Look at the way the first two games were. It was just the Canes had more mojo going, and, and he, I don't think Leonard was at his best in that series. And uh, yeah, the Islanders were maxed out after their very impressive performance in the first round. Unbelievable. Absolutely. Well, uh, first, go ahead, Sean. I'm sorry. That's very, very true. Um, so, John, my question for you is, that obviously, like you said, last a season, a great run, the conference of finals. This season now, like you said, the team is playing really, really well. I know the pause has been on for a long time, but up until the pause, can you give me and Ro kind of like a, your thoughts on the season overview of what you thought and how you felt the team um, was playing up until the pause? Well, this team had won three in a row at the pause and looked like they they found their game finally, made a couple of changes at the trading deadline. But to be honest with you, I think the league was really in a scramble and it was really hard to tell who was going to emerge. And that's the beauty of the NHL. The parity is so strong. It's hard to tell, uh, you know, which obviously the Bruins were having this spectacular season, but <laughs> Tampa Bay did a year ago with 62 wins and they were ousted in four straight in the first round. So anything right. is possible. So it's so long ago. It's really hard to remember at this right. point <laughs> where we go from here will be, will be interesting. Um, and, and, but I, I, I do think the season itself, you look at the way the Islanders were at the very beginning of the year, unbeatable there for a long stretch. And they were kind of in a malaise around the pause the team that really impressed me all season were the Rangers. The way the Rangers were able to really not supposed to be in the mix at all. And, and David Quinn did an outstanding job coaching. Artemi Panarin is probably going to be one of the three finalists for the MVP. That's right. And then the young goalie comes along and, you know, did he surplant Hank or not? We'll see. But he's got a bright future. So the Rangers deserve to be in the mix here if we resume play. And, and out west, again, St. Louis. You know, you look at, at at those teams, Vegas coming on, you know, after the trading deadline, uh, but tremendous parity. So it's hard to say who had the edge, which is a good thing. John, do you see hockey coming back? I do. I do. I'm optimistic that it's going to come back. I think there's there's way too many reasons, as, as again, like the what everybody says today, you know, you got to have that safety factor, right? Eliminate that. You take that out of the equation as much as possible. There's risk in everything we do in life. I think it's important now to start to amp up and get back to as close to normal as possible. There are financial reasons for doing this, and they are very important if you can. Uh, and then I think as we get into the summer, the appetite for people to watch any kind of sport, I guarantee as we take this, the NASCAR race is going to be off the charts today. There could be people watching this just because it's something of, of live competition. You know, we have a few UFC fights so far. But as we get into this, if hockey resumes, and I think it will, um, it's going to be widely accepted as, as great television. Obviously, no fans. That's the unfortunate thing. But I think if we delay the next season as, as long as we can to the beginning of December, 
something along those lines. My prayer and my hope is that we have therapies. We're close to a vaccine. We're in a better place. We have more confidence. We, we've brought the thing down. We've survived a resurgence if there is one. It's just depending on who you ask today, how, do you, how the hell does anybody know where this is going? Um, that's what's so frustrating about it. But I'm optimistic that the NHL will play again this season. I think there's an appetite to do so unless logistics and safety are such a risk that it doesn't make any sense. And I would say absolutely not. Shelve it. Let's get on with the next season. That's very, very true. John, obviously, as you said, growing up, Springfield, Boston, that whole town, obviously the Bruins are, you know, you know really, really good. But the two uh, uh, college teams are also good, Boston U and Boston uh, College. Can, uh, can, you, can you just tell me and Will how big hockey is in that town? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny. When um, this whole thing started, and, and, and really hockey's uh, birth in Massachusetts and New England, because the, Bru the Boston teams, as you know, are New England teams. It's such a small area with all the states. You know, only the Patriots call themselves New England, but everybody else could. So in 1970, those Bruins teams were so dominant, led by Bobby Orr, and Phil Esposito, and all the rest of them, that they did two things very well. They played extremely well, and they were ahead of the curve. They had every game on television. And so even where we lived in Springfield, 90 miles west of Boston, my dad could go up in the middle of winter and physically take a ladder and go up and position the antenna to bring the signal in. And we lived on a little bit of a hill. And for whatever reason, the signal came in pretty clear. And I could call the games and his buddies would come over and they'd have a couple beverages and sit around and little Johnny would entertain them. And that's what we did. But the Bruins were responsible for rinks municipal rinks going up throughout New England, particularly in Massachusetts and in the Boston area. So from that point on, there was a generation of kids who became hockey players, emulating the Bruins. A lot of great athletes were able to take up the sport. And you look in the 70s and into the 80s, that's when most of the American-born players either came from Minnesota or Massachusetts to play in the NHL. Anywhere else, if you lived in Arizona, you had no chance. Now you do. Austin Matthews has proved that. He was born in California, raised in Scottsdale. He, he's, he's proved that. So now we have a totally different landscape, but that's basically what happened there. And so the colleges were always good, but the colleges started to become even better. And the big four of um, Northeastern, Harvard, Boston College, and Boston University who play for the bean pot, spectacular Division One hockey. And then you have UMass and UConn and Quinnipiac and U Lowell and all these different teams now, UNH, you know, all in the area of who've become uh, outstanding programs. So there is a strong int interest in New England in, uh, in college hockey. There's, there's no question about it. A great area for sports in general, as you know. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, John. I got to get back to the Whalers here for a second because sure. they started up in Boston – Played at the Boston Garden in the in the WHL, and now, you know, they moved. They moved over to Hartford. They had they had Gordy Howe playing with them. Obviously, the great Ron Francis played with them. And now, you know, what what kind of players was it was it like? What was what was the the other league like back in that time? And number two, what was the Whaler fan like? Yeah, that's a great question. You know. The um, World Hockey Association, okay, you got to understand this. I, I grew up in Springfield. They also had American Hockey League play then, too, back when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Springfield Kings. Butch Goring was a great player, championship player at that level. Billy Smith started his career, the great Islander goalie, in Springfield with the Springfield Kings. So when the World Hockey Association came to fruition in 1972, they took a lot of the players from the AHL. They had big names like Bobby Hull and Derek Sanderson and Bernie Perrant, Jerry Cheevers, who had left the NHL for these huge contracts, big money in those days in the early 70s to join this new hockey league to rival the NHL. 
but they had to fill out rosters. So they took a lot of the players from the American Hockey League and gave them more money and opportunity in bigger league cities. And they got to fly as opposed to ride buses. My point is it almost put the American Hockey League out of business in the mid seventies. The league was down to six teams. One of those teams was bankrupt and folded. They had to prop each other up just to stay in business. So as a fan, I didn't like the World Hockey Association that much. Oddly enough, I would end up someday working for the Whalers. But then as the 70s marched on, the merger happened with Quebec, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Hartford. They joined the NHL in 79. Gordy Howe, Dave Keon, Bobby Hull were all on the original Whaler team. I started to go to games there because it was close to Springfield and follow the team and appreciate their history a little bit. And the Whaler fans were, were very passionate. And I think we had started to see a change in generation. Uh, they, it was, it's an insurance city. And in the 70s and 80s, it was a white collar place. So that it was not like going to Boston Garden. Going to Boston Garden, at times you take your life into your hands. Um, but this was more or less, if you want, uh, in a way, but maybe it's a bad analogy, uh, Nassau Coliseum compared to the Garden. You know, maybe there was a little bit of that dynamic early on. Mm -hmm. um, but in Hartford, the fans were there, but they weren't as crazy as the Bruin fans. But that changed into the eight, late 80s when they had dominant teams and into the 90s when kids started to grow up. And unfortunately, we lost all of that through some bad years, ownership change, the move. And I would that's the low point of my career to go through something like that, to see a team relocate and leave a city, and leave your fans. Mm -hmm. and that's a horrible experience if you're connected with the team. Mm -hmm. that's, that's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, right? John, my last question for you is this. Um, obviously, as we know, Raleigh is a great town. The hockey fans, they come out and they do everything so, so well. I always wanted to ask you or someone that lives around there this. Do you know or how big of a fan base does people in South Carolina like do those like like do those fans come and watch those games too? Well, the team up until recently had the American League for, uh, affiliate in Charlotte, which is mm -hmm. two hours and forty-five uh, minutes southwest of Raleigh, mm -hmm. and now that that's going to change this year. They 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 drop the affiliation. Looks like the Canes will be in Chicago. There'll be a new affiliate in Charlotte, but Greenville, South Carolina is the ECHL affiliate. So there's proximity there too. So I think we do draw some fans from South Carolina. Our broadcasts go into South Carolina. So we're on Fox Sports Carolina. So it's, it's a combination of the two states and right. a little bit, of, little bit of Georgia too. So we have a, a, a wide reach that way. Um, but we, I think most of our fans are, are centralized here, Raleigh, right. Durham, Chapel Hill, Northern, North Raleigh. Um, that's mostly where our fans come from. A little bit from Greensboro, which is 70 miles northwest. That's where this team started for two years before they moved into the building here. And then you have Charlotte. And we do have some fans who migrate in now. And remember this too, Sean, that even though the Canes have been here since 97, there's been minor league hockey in North Carolina since the 50s. There was wow. a team in Greensboro for a number of years. There was a team in Charlotte for a number of years. And just before we got here, the Raleigh Ice Caps of the ECHL played in Raleigh. So they, okay. they, they had somewhat of a cult following. It, it, it's not, no, not close at all to college basketball and college football. But there right. was a little bit of a cult following for hockey before we got here. Perfect. Uh, John, that's awesome right there. And especially since PNC Arena is literally right across the street from the NC, NC State campus over there, right right across the street, there's the football stadium. It's just absolutely nuts. And especially, I, I've only been to PNC Arena once. It was for the Islanders-Hurricanes game back for the home opener in 2018. And that was an experience within itself just going. Uh, you know, for me – you always hear about the low attendance numbers and everything like that, you know, but when that, when that building gets loud and when it gets rocking, it's something to behold. And it's a really big arena. 
you know, what, what must that be like? And especially since you got to, you know, see a Stanley Cup, play, uh, Stanley Cup final and got to experience a winner there. What was yeah. that like? Tremendous. But uh, you must have been happy, Will, on that night. That was an overtime win for the Islanders, right? Yes. Yep. Josh yeah, Bailey right? with the game winner. Jo Josh Bailey. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure I remember that. <laughs> Sorry yeah, about that. Just want to make sure I remember that. But anyway, the, the fans here are unique. We have, as you saw, the best uh, tailgating situation you can have. Uh, That's right. there's a, it's, a, it's a sports complex, so you have Carter Finley Stadium where the NC State Wolfpack play. PNC Arena is right across the parking lot. You have all this space and weather to get outside and do what they do for football long and hard all day long. And on a beautiful Saturday, they'll start at 1, 2 in the afternoon for a 7 o'clock game. They're ready when the doors open. They're ready to come in and go crazy. In the playoffs, it's phenomenal. I've been lucky enough to do playoff games of virtually every building in the National Hockey League. I've seen them all. Um, I, without bias, can say this place is right there with some of the great places uh, that you see around the league. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a newer building. It doesn't have the uh, tightness of Nassau Coliseum, which is still think is the loudest. Um, because of the, you know, how old the building is and the noise just bounces off and the fans are great. But PNC Arena rivals it. And PNC Arena in the playoffs and now this past season, I think they, it, it's unfortunate the season ended when it did. I think they're on pace at 15 or 16 sellouts this year, which is, which is phenomenal for this market, just right. building it back again. So they're getting a, a respectable following once again, and they know more about hockey than meets the eye. It's easy for people in the north, in Canada, Minnesota, Chicago, St. Louis, to say, oh, what do they know? What do they know about hockey in Raleigh, North Carolina? Well, they've paid attention for years and they're knowledgeable. And, and they'll they'll encourage the team just for having a good forechecking sequence. You know, it doesn't have to go in the net. They'll they'll get out there and and do what they're supposed to do positionally or kill a penalty and the crowd comes to life at the right time. So I, I think sometimes they get dissed. They shouldn't. Um, they love the team. The players love playing here. Uh, this, this group, last season and this, uh, basically a brand new team, have really uh, figured out what this place is all about. And, and it's funny, this season, all the players were telling me how recognizable they are again in the market. They kind of liked it when they first got here maybe two years ago because no one knew them. They could go out. But now, because of what happened last year and the bunch of jerks and all that stuff, when they go out, they, they, they get recognized. Everybody likes to have their ego stroke. Some people will tell you, I don't like that. Um, I won't. <laughs> if people say something nice to me, I'm appreciative. And I think the players feel that way too. You know, you're like you play, there's a oneness between the team and the community that's, that's not available in all markets. No, not at all, especially in the big markets like here right. in New York, LA, you know, even up in Boston somewhat to a degree. Uh, John, you mentioned Barclays Center before being probably the worst vantage point for a broadcaster. What's the best arena that you've called a game at? Montreal. Montreal, without a doubt. Uh, atmosphere, but most importantly, broadcast location is on a gondola, circular gondola that hangs off the roof. You're basically right over the near boards, hanging right over the rink. You can hear the game. You can feel the game. You feel like you're part of the game. And it's way easier to identify players and see the crossbars and see the goalposts and hmm. see all those things without – there's some places, Will, in the NHL, you're so far away, sometimes you're guessing. You want to hear the effects might pick up the ping off the goalposts, but sometimes you look at the ref and he'll wash it out and you just think, you know, off the post and you hold <laughs> your breath and watch the replay – and most of the time you're right, but a lot of the time you're, you, you thought you saw it off the post. It didn't even, didn't even come close. Mm -hmm. That's what makes broadcasting hockey very challenging. It's, it's a hard sport to do. It really is. Absolutely, absolutely. John, last question for you here. You've been, you've been with the Hurricanes for their whole existence in Carolina and the two final years in Hartford. Who's on the Mount Rushmore of – uh, Hartford Whalers and Carolina Hurricanes together. And one other part, too, here. What do you think of the whole uh, Whalers night 
bringing back the whole Whalers uniforms and stuff like that yeah. down in Raleigh. I love the Whalers night once it happened. I didn't like it at first. I thought it was, to be honest with you, and I said this, um, I thought it was a reach marketing wise, um, cash grab, sell some merchandise. The owner was smart because he, he finally recognized that this is a popular uh, piece of merchandise at the NHL store and online and everything. People still love the colors. And I was thinking, you know what? Um, I remember the bad stuff. I remember how we ripped the hearts out of those passionate fans in Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I still felt after all this time, I felt bad about it. So I wasn't hundred percent sure until the day of the game, I had to go to the locker room, uh, take some photos with our equipment, our equipment guys who've been with us from Hartford. Um, Mike Rogers was there, longtime whaler. And I got to see the sweaters hanging up in the stalls. And it's like three in the afternoon. I was like, wow, this is beautiful. And then when the game started, the lighting and the colors and the way they've replicated these uniforms, they look better than the originals. And then the way it played off television against the Bruins, it was a success. And then when I heard Brass Bonanza again, they scored five or six goals that, that night, December 23rd, the season before last, um, and beat the Bruins. And they needed that win. Um, but I'll tell you what, it was remarkable. It was a remarkable experience. Um, so, you know, as far as a Mount Rushmore, Ron Francis, um, Rod Brindamore, and then I, I think, you know, you really start in a, in a place where you can go a variety of different ways. And I'd like to say that, you know, Glenn Wesley holds a spot there because his number has been retired. But there are so many other guys that I would like to leave those spots available because I think Sebastian Ajo, Andre Svechnikov are the first two I'd start with from this generation. Right. And I think it won't be long before those guys should be on the, that, that level. So I would blend the two, you know, you, you could really go back Gordy Howe if you wanted to go way back original whaler did mm -hmm. considerable time. World Hockey Association and the NHL. No one wears number nine. It's not retired, but it's done intentionally. No one wears or has worn number nine as a hurricane. So he'd, he'd be there. But I, I would, I, I really respect what's happening now and the level of those two players and what they're like as people. And I think before this is over, both those guys are going to be right there. Both those guys have a chance to be Hall of Fame type players. I really believe that. Okay, that's that's very interesting right there. Not not hit hearing Cam Ward either. That you know that's Cam Ward and Archer Cam Ward. Then you have Archer Zerbe. Yeah. You know you've got those two goalies would be neck and neck. There's as I think out loud. There's a lot of guys you could throw in there. Right. Then it would it wouldn't be a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. So Rushmore's for me are like Hall of Fame. You know I don't spend a lot of time debating Hall of Fame. Right. Because I either believe an athlete's a Hall of Famer or not. Mm -hmm start splitting hairs on numbers and seasons and championships are, are one thing. Okay. Right. But right. when you get into whether or not a guy's a hall of famer and you're having a debate to yeah. me, that means they might not be a hall of famer, you know, yeah. when you think about it, but you know, uh, Mariano Rivera, Derek Jeter, slam dunk, right. That's, that's yeah. case closed. Yep. Not everybody's <laughs> like that, but in a rush more for franchises, I think you have to be certain. Yeah, and I wouldn't be. I, I, I think there'd be a lot of guys you, you could get in there and uh, and talk about. But in terms of goalies, Wardo's the best goalie that's ever played for this franchise. There's no question. Mm -hmm. But if Urbe had played as long as Ward with this team, he'd be there too. He was that good. And he was a, one of the principal reasons they made the Stanley Cup final in 2002. Without him, they don't get there. Mm, that's very interesting and well said right there, man. John, thank you so much for coming on and sacrificing some time and talking whalers, hurricanes, and even hey. life in general with us. We really appreciate it. I do have – this is the last question. I always do this almost every show. How do the people follow the one and only John Forslund on social media? At John Forslund. Very simple. That's, that's the one place. Um, I, I have Instagram. I don't do it. I just look at my kids' stuff. and. Uh, and, and Facebook is, you know, it's a, 
I don't know. That's a family album. I don't get involved in that either. I have an, right. I have two accounts actually. One's private, one's not, but I don't really do much. So it's at John Forslund. That's it. That's a Twitter handle. I got to check somehow. So that's me. <laughs> and, uh, and I enjoy it. I, 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 in this day, in this time, guys, I don't enjoy it as much. There's a lot of stuff on there that um, I, I'm, I'm ashamed of as a country. I just wish we could come together better than we are. But that's, uh, that's my hope. But anyway, I, I, I enjoy social media for the right reasons. You can connect with people. You can, you can open up your mind to some things the right way. You can follow your teams. You can connect with athletes in a way. You can see what they're all about. I wish, I wish when I was younger, as a fan growing up, I wish we had that. We, we basically had to buy yearbooks and look at bio, bios and say, a guy likes to eat, have a milk and cookie before he goes to bed. That was basically it, you know. Uh, yeah. we, didn't, we didn't have all – we didn't get to see these guys at home and doing all that kind of thing. But, uh, hey, listen, stay safe. Thanks for having me. Um, and for all anybody who watches this, all the fans, just uh, uh, let's get through this. Let's get to the blue sky and the other side of this mess and get back to normal. Absolutely. John, I hope you're staying safe down in Carolina right now. And one day, I know that Barclays has, you know, the ah. – the ultimate thing at Park, even though it's not going to happen anymore, where you you can actually get to meet the commentators instead of having to go all the way upstairs, whether yeah. it be at Nassau and everything's all blocked off because of that. You know, maybe one day outside of Nassau, you know, I like to, you know, we we like to see you, you know. So well, just wanted to tell you that. Let's do it, okay? You know how to get in touch with me, so yes, we'll sir. make it happen somehow, okay? Yes, like to meet both you guys, yeah, no doubt. Thank you so much, John. John, Keep up the great work. Yep. Thank Keep you. up the we great work. It. Thank you very you much. Be you safe. You and your you family too. be safe, man. Thank you. Thank you. You got it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was the... See ya. <laughs> Take it easy, John. Be good. Be Thanks safe. Thanks so much. Stay Thank in touch, you. both of you. Okay? Absolutely. Right. Will do. Okay, guys. See ya. See ya. That was the one and only John Forslund from – Fox Sports Carolinas and from NBC Sports Network, the voice of the Carolina Hurricanes. Truly an awesome time having Mr. Forceland on. Sean, what an episode, what a guy, and more importantly, just what a, what a historian of not only hockey, but just sports in general. Just how much that man knows and just, I, I feel like I learned a lot today after talking to John Forslund. Sean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, John was great. And, um, you know, and the piece of advice that he gave uh, is, you know, it's very important well, because we live in a copycat world. Everybody wants, like, I was, well, I was just having this conversation uh, um, uh, with my friend. How many teams in the NFL drafted to, to, drafted to copycat the Chiefs? A yeah. lot of teams, but it's a copycat world. So I love mm -hmm. what he said. You can look up to someone, but don't try to emulate someone because it's already been done. So that was very, very well said by John. And uh, yeah, well, you know, it'll be a blast to meet him uh, one day, uh, hopefully soon. So uh, definitely want to thank him for uh, coming on. I'm glad that he's been staying safe. Absolutely. And, you know, John has, he's got Long Island ties with working with the uh, Islanders minor league affiliate back in the day. And, you know, having to go to Adelphi uh, in Garden City. So that's absolutely huge. And, yeah. you know, for him to just sacrifice some time and, like I said before, just actually learn something today is just absolutely nuts. And hopefully this podcast, I know many, many people will probably listen in on this. And it's definitely going to be uh, awesome to hear John's voice again. And, you know, anytime I always – I always, that's one thing that there's one thing that I should have asked him and maybe I'll ask him on, on a question, but what, what might've been like one of his favorite moments, just, uh, just absolutely crazy, but just one of his favorite broadcasting moments might've been, uh, something too, but Hey, there's always another time for that. So it's just okay. absolutely unbelievable. Uh, Sean, any final thoughts on this episode? No, well, I um, just want to thank John again for, like you said, taking some time. Well, a uh, shout out to you for getting the job done. Uh, Will was the main man in getting John to, uh, you know, um, to 
come on the show. So, well, awesome job with John. And, um, uh, yeah, man, I can't wait for uh, Hockey to be back. The one thing that he did say, well, and I did agree with him on is, well, remember we had some Hockey Talk shows, and I was like, he was right. The Rangers, this was supposed to be like a, a rebuild. rebuild. And, for, and for them to be chasing us down, when I say us, I obviously mean the Islanders. And Islanders, you know, right. um, they were right right there. So, yeah. Shut up, man. Yeah, absolutely. And he was right on that 100%. Make no mistake about it. He, he covers every, everything just about it. He, he's just a hockey, hockey student, a hockey historian. So that's pretty awesome right there. Uh, me personally, no final thoughts outside of just giving a shout out to all of our essential workers, whether it be doctors, firemen, cops, nurses, EMT workers, uh, grocery store workers, and, you know, construction workers that are working on it essential infrastructure and everything like that, you know, and even the postal worker that's going out there delivering mail each and every day, whether it be UPS, FedEx, or USPS, just got to give everybody their shout out because, hey, without you guys, there'd be uh, nothing, nothing in this country without you guys right now. So huge shout out to them. And hey, let's keep going, man, you know, and Shout out to you as well for just doing what you're doing right now, Sean. Really appreciate you, bud. Yes, sir. Appreciate right. you too. On that note, just want to thank John Forsland again for coming on. And for my wonderful co-host, Sean Thomas, a.k.a. Shawnee on the mic, I am your host, Will Trucci, logging out. We will talk to you guys soon. Peace out. Stay safe, everybody. And God bless all of you.